traducida, que mi mujer es tan bueno como el descarte. Pero hoy no me lo trajo, si no yo te lo diera, para que por lo menos te enterara. Debe ser la de la semana pasada que no venimos porque ya está onda. No, es para que no más gente le tenga en inglés. Hay muchos que hablan inglés, que hablan inglés, que hablan inglés, que hablan inglés, pero en Europa que la traducen. God bless you. Welcome. Uh, today is obviously Sunday. It's the Lord's day. It's not the Lord's half hour. It's not the Lord's ten minutes. But it's known as the Lord's day. It is His day that we set aside for the Lord. The whole day to be a day of rest, to be a day of soaking in God's presence. That we're just going to be together for an hour or so. But it doesn't.
doesn't finish there. It's the Lord's day. Amen. So let's stand. Good morning to everybody online. Welcome. Over to you in a different language. Bienvenida a todos y todas que nos están uniéndose con nosotros aquí en Celebrate Life. Bienvenido. Hoy es el día del Señor, no es la media hora del Señor, es ni la hora del Señor, es el día completo que dedicamos al Señor. Wir grüßen euch, Gottes Segen. Heute ist Sonntag, der Tag des Herrn. Und es ist nicht nur eine halbe Stunde oder eine Stunde, es ist der Gottes Tag, der Sonntag. Und wir ruhen uns aus und ruhen uns in seinem Wort hier aus. Please stand. Auch zu Hause. Schön auf. Noch etwas sagen. Let us pray. Hallelujah. Our Father, Sovereign God, you that always have been, always will be, you that saved us, you that adopted us, you that gave us your only begotten son, you gave us Jesus. We are here gathered together to worship your son, our Lord, our King, our Savior, our Lord Jesus. We are here to celebrate him. We are here to say thank you. We are here to worship you. Almighty, all-knowing, all-powerful Lord. We are here to pray and praise you. We are here to hear your word. And may today be the day that we learn a little bit more than last Sunday. It is your word that becomes your scripture alive in us. Thank you so much for this day, your day, the Lord's day. In your son's name we pray, amen.
it is difficult, but when we just think a bit back of the good things that happened during this week, I'm sure you will find something. Well, at least you feel you're alive. Amen. Hallelujah. Let us pray. We want heart. We want a heart. To the living God. Father, Sovereign Lord, we want to say thank you. We want to say thank you that we hear. We want to say thank you that we made it actually last week. Sometimes the pressure is so, so hard, so much on that we don't know where to turn to the left or the right, but we can look up on you, we can trust you, we can seek you. And we know that somewhere, somehow, all things are working out together for good with those who love you. And we do love you. We thank you. We want to say thank you for your son. Thank you for saving us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for that perfect sacrifice that you gave yourself. You gave yourself to die for us, to take all the sins upon you. You shed your blood for us. You died for us on that cross so we can be forgiven. So we can have eternal life. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You are our King, our Lord, our Savior. Without you, we couldn't be adopted. Without you, we couldn't go just to the throne of the Father and pray. Eternal hell. That would have been the right punishment for us. But you saved us. You saved us. Oh, Lord, you're so gracious to us. Your mercies are new and fresh every single day. What else do you want? We give thanks, praise, and glory unto you. We worship you. How wonderful you are. How trustworthy, how perfect, how just, how righteous you are. We pray that we walk a little bit more in righteousness and holiness today than yesterday. Forgive us from our sins. Even Jesus died for us and paid the penalty. We are still guilty. And every day, there is something. Forgive us from our sins in thoughts, in wrong motives of our hearts, in action, in deeds. In words, disobedience, wash and cleanse us from our sins that our conscience can be pure again and our thoughts can be pure again towards you. You that know everything about us. There's nothing hidden. You are so merciful. We want to say thank you that Marilyn is better, Sarah is better, Sue is better. Oh, Father, it is you with your healing touch. And thank you for the family members that help, for the doctors and nurses. How wonderful you are. How wonderful our name is. We pray for the souls of our families, the intimate families, which sometimes it looks impossible. But for you, everything is possible. You are the all-knowing, all-powerful God. We pray for our children to be saved. We pray that they come back to you, to your word, to the church. We pray for the extended family, for their souls to be saved, for our friends, our workers, our neighbors. We pray for the governors to be saved, the judges to be saved. We pray for the salvation of their souls. We pray for our missionaries. We pray for math, all these families who really leave everything behind and go into the mission field. They risk their lives every day. We pray for protection. We pray for providence. We pray for peace, for joy, for help. As we do pray, 
for all these families and people involved in the war. Oh, Lord God, how we wish and pray that this will stop now. It is like a, like a half scary movie, but it's real. Pray for healing, for protection. We pray that you keep them safe. But we know one thing. Everything can be taken away. But not your word. Not your Holy Spirit. Not the church. Everything will pass away one day. But you and your word are always be. And we thank you, Lord. For eternal life <coughs> that you have given us. Heaven is waiting one day for us. We thank you so much. And we pray all this in Christ's name. We will take up the offering now. And next week we will have missions. Not this Sunday. We postponed it to the next week to next Sunday, right? So we take up. Well, Missions, we, 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 we made a decision it's going to be next Sunday, but if you have your offering ready, you can put it in the basket. But now we just pray for the normal offering for um, for the church to be open, this building, water, electricity, community fees, all that there is. Amen? Taxes, yes. <laughs> Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, thank you so much that we are still here. And the church is still open. We thank you so much for everyone that continuously gives with a joyful heart. This generous heart from our family, it just amazes me every month. We want to say thank you. Thank you for every family member. Thank you that they are just so an awesome giver that we can pay every bill. It is you, Lord, that makes it happen. It is you that puts the tire in the heart. Otherwise, it will not work. So we bless everyone. We say thank you. And you take the glory and honor and praise for every offering in Jesus' name. Amen. The basket is right over there as usual. Father, we just want to thank you for, for this day. We want to thank you for the new day. We want to thank you that your mercies are new and fresh each morning. That in itself is worthy of your praise. And we want to thank you for your, your gift of your word, the gift of your spirit, the gift of your son, the gift of salvation. And once again, that again is worthy of the days of the praise of Pray this morning, Father, that uh, you use me as your instrument to speak your word. You answer me as myself, and uh, it's your word that comes out. Through your spirit, you will shine it onto our hearts, you will shine it into our minds. It's our intellect because we need to engage with our minds. So the word tells us that. Through the spirit, all of our thoughts, all of our minds, to praise you and worship you. And so Guide us and inspire us by your spirit as we go through this teaching this morning. And may it be to the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. If you'd like to uh, turn your, open your Bibles, turn your Bibles on, we're in 2 Corinthians 13, chapter 5. It will be on the screen as well. And as a little post note, we're going to celebrate our anniversary next month. The plan is to celebrate next month, and I'm working on having a guest speaker over if we can. So, Second um, Corinthians 13, verse five. Verse five. If you remember, the last few months we've been going over the, the three books of, of John, 
And in the first round especially, we had nine tests. I'm sure you wrote them all down and, and or you, you remember them, but the nine tests were walking in the light, confession of sin, obedience, love of the brethren, hatred for the world, perseverance in doctrine, righteousness, the Spirit's testimony, and confidence in God. They were the nine tests that we looked at. They were the self-tests that, that, we, uh, that we looked at. And today we're going to look at, believe it or not, we're going to look into doctrine. Because doctrine is really important for the church, and it's something that's been missing, in, I believe, in the church in general. Uh, not just this church, but in the churches in general for, for many years. And doctrine is not boring, doctrine is necessary. It is much required and much needed. And uh, so we're going to look into to, to this this morning. If you've got a pen and paper, you want to take notes, then now will be an ideal time to get the pen and paper out and to get yourself prepared because this is, uh, this is going to be quite important. So what we're looking at today, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, says examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. Test yourselves. You're not having a test by someone else. You're going to test yourself. No one's going to test you or try and trick you. It's a self-test. So over the next few weeks, maybe, I don't know how long this is going to take, we're going to go on a journey. We're not going to look back in history particularly. We're not even going to try and project on what's going to come. But it's going to be a deep journey. And we're going to do it all together. As a church. As a fellowship. This journey is going to be necessary for us all, for me, as well as it will be for you. It's going to be a very personal experience. For me especially, it's a great privilege and an honour to be able to bring God's Word week in, week out to study and to bring God's Word to you guys. But it's also a great responsibility that I take seriously. So we're going to go on this journey together. Where are we going? We're going into you. You. It says examine yourselves. So we're going into you. We're not talking about your neighbour. We're not talking about your husband or your wife. We're not talking about your best friends. We're talking about you. It's your journey. Your journey. My heart for this church is that none of us slip through the net. Okay? None of us get lost. None of us lose our way, or none of us can even say, I didn't know. This is for my clear conscience, this is also for your clear conscience. Because when I re listen or I read to the great preachers, those such as Spurgeon or Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, George Whitfield or anyone like that, every time I read their writings, they challenge the listener. They challenge the listener. They don't please the listener. The listener doesn't walk out of the church particularly feeling good about themselves. They actually walk out of the church thinking, I've got to change. I need to make some changes. The Word of God is there to challenge us. It's there to correct us. What does it say in 2 Timothy 3.16? All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realise what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong. That's what we have the Word of God for. It's not just a book to put on the mantelpiece or to tuck under your arm on a Sunday. It's there to guide us and to teach us and to show us through the Holy Spirit. Psalm 119 says, Thy Word is what? A lamp unto my feet. We're walking in darkness, so we need a lamp. His word is that lamp. If you keep that lamp closed, then you need the lamp switched off. 
they're going to stumble, they're going to fall. So many people now today have been brought up on a doctrine and a teaching to search the word of God for his what? His promises. And they cherry pick the promises out of the Bible. This promise is for me, this promise is for me. God says this, God says that about me. God says I can have this, whatever I ask for, he'll give me. And we, we can read, and we can read all these things, books, or listen to their teachings, but they're avoiding one big subject. Repentance, sin, obedience. They miss that all out. The need to confess our sin. We read that in 1 John. Confession of sin. Walking in the light. Because it comes from the word of God, not from the word of man. The work of the church is to build up and equip the saints. You are the saints. You are the saints. Saint Diane. Saint Lily. Saint Lee. Saint Marianne. We are the saints. We are the saints. And that's what the church is for. The equipping of the saints. The church isn't to make programs. The church isn't to, to get involved in social matters. The church is to preach the word of God. To teach the word of God. And to instruct the church on the word of God. As we saw last week, or a few weeks ago, if you remember. Our job is to feed the sheep. The menu for the sheep is what's in here. And we don't change the menu for the goats. Our word is to teach. Our job is to teach. Let us uh, turn to Ephesians. Ephesians 4. Uh, verse 11 to 16. It's going to be on the screen as well, I believe. I put it and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Before we continue, I just want to stop there a second. Um, I've checked this in most translations, and it all says the same thing. It does say, he himself gave. It doesn't say, he himself gives. Gave is the past tense. He gave, he himself, apostles. That is not for anyone else to give apostles. Okay? He himself gave, finished, done, some to be apostles. He does not continue to give. There's no translation that says gives. Okay? He himself, and in my Bible it's both capital H's, that means Jesus, he himself gave. Finished. And it's in an illness as well. To be apostles, some prophets, then comes us, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, we are the body of Christ. Saints. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children. No. We should no longer be youths. We should no longer act like kids. That we should no longer be immature. That we should actually be grown-ups. Continue. Tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men. Unfortunately, we've all fallen foul of that. Trickery of men and women. In the cunning craftiness of defeat, deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love. We may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. From whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edification of itself in love. Wow! That is the church. We're to be grown-ups. Mature. We're not a glorified youth group, okay? Speaking truth. Sometimes speaking the truth hurts. When you 
you love someone, if you sell them the truth, don't you? No. If you don't love them, then you'll say, oh, no, everything's fine, whatever. But if you love someone, you speak the truth. So it's for us to speak the truth. I don't know, I'm sure most of you have probably been watching it on YouTube, the uh, debacle, I think would be the best word, of uh, Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. Uh, and I'm sure we've all got our own opinions about what we think about all this and come to our own conclusions as much as well, as the world has. And most of what he decided before this even comes to the jury yet, who's going to win and who's going to lose, but that's part of that, so. And I think most of us would admire people like actors, you know, their acting ability and how they manage to, to portray a part convincingly. I admire it. I think that these actors and actresses how they can change roles in different movies and be so convincing. I think it's, it's, it's a gift, it's a skill, it's a talent. But we, we can tend to get um, focused on these people because of their character and we think that's what they really like or think that's, you know, they're a really nice person. But if, you, if you've been watching it and you see some of the messages and the things that have been said, the things that have been done, they are vile, they are not nice, they are hateful, they're disgusting, nasty people. Both of them. Both of them. And it really shows the real character of that person, yeah. what they're like, when the camera stop rolling. And for us, I thought, it's the same, eh? Because when we walk out of our front doors in the morning, are the cameras rolling for us? Are we putting on a persona that we're not really? Are we acting a part? Are we playing up? Are we doing something that we're not? But what are we really like when the doors are closed? Do I put on a show? Do I put on a false face? So all those that know me, do I pretend? Because if you do that, you're going to get worn out. You're going to get found out. But you're going to get worn out. Do I reflect and display all my hurts? Do I reflect and display all my trials? Do I reflect and display all my disappointments? Or do I do the opposite? Do I play out like everything's awesome? Everything's great. I've got no problems in my life. Because this is the other thing that I believe it gets taught today in Christendom, in the churches, that you are to have faith. And you are to speak negatives. Because if you speak negatives, then the angels that are coming with the good stuff are going to turn around and go back again. And you confuse the angels when you speak bad stuff. Or You've got to have faith and, and let everyone see that faith in you and you can stand, and we've done it, I've done it. You stand on faith, but it's fakey. It doesn't work. You can pray for hours and hours and fast for days and days, speaking in all sorts of weird languages, doing all sorts of weird stuff, but nothing changes. Because God is sovereign and God makes them decisions. He's not going, oh, they're fasting now for three days. I better give them what they want. Mm -mm. What does it say? He will supply all your what? No. Need. No. It's a need. What's needed in our lives? Salvation? Spiritual renewal? Is that more important than the flash car, the flash house? Yeah? Need. Not wants. We don't go to the dog with a want list, with a wish list. So what's our character? What is our character? What is our real, true character? Christians, saints, we are. We should be known as that. But genuine, be genuine. Be genuine with people, be honest with people. Don't put up some fake attitudes that because you're a Christian, everything is going to be great. Show me one part in this book where everything works out great for the apostles or the disciples. They were all martyred apart from John. Shipwrecked, beaten, stoned. That's not what we're talking to churches these days. Everything's going to be fine, everything's going to be great. You'll get that car, you'll get that house, you'll get that sort of call. God wants you to have that. It's false. It's false doctrine. In fact, it's heresy. We're to be light to the world. We're to carry the word of God in our hearts 
and display the love of Christ to all. That just means showing love, being lovely, be nice, be courteous, be kind. And if you don't want to be, then don't. Like going, keep out of places where you know you shouldn't go. It's not always easy, is it? But this is what the Word of God teaches us. That the Word of God changes us. This is what we're going to be getting at over the, over the next I don't know, few sessions. So, this is a, a, a doctrine. This is a doctrinal teaching. So it's got a name. And it's actually called The Character of Genuine Saving Faith. This is the character of genuine saving faith. And what we're going to do is, it actually says in the subtitle, Evidences that neither prove nor disprove one's faith. So we're going to look at some evidences. And then there's a second subtitle which is called Visible Morality. Visible, that people can see. And morality is your moral standards. So let's look at Matthew 19. We're going to be in Matthew 19, verses 16 to 27. Most of you know this quite well. Let me just add that this is um, an account in the Bible. It's not a story. It's not a fairy tale. Jesus counsels the young rich ruler. Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. But if you want to enter into life, Keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honour your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbour as yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept from my youth, what do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go. Sell what you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful. For he had great possessions. Good teacher, what thing shall I do that I may receive eternal life? First thing we notice here is that the young man recognises who Jesus is. He recognised that Jesus was good, but the word he could have used would have been more appropriate, would have been rabbi, wouldn't it? Rabbi. Teacher. Neither did he use the word Lord. And it implies this because, because of his wealth, because of his social standing, it's come quite commonly believed that he was a leader of a local synagogue, but because of his Stature, he fell on a level plane with Jesus. He thought he was equal to Jesus. And he's pretty puffed up. All these things I've kept, remember, he says. So he, these words display his character immediately because if you look at it, he says, What good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? This is the way of the Pharisees. The I and the work. Work for this. Work for that. And you will get, if you work for you, the I. For the Pharisees, as we hear so many times today, and even with the word faith teaching, it's working your way into salvation. It's works. Whether that's works of praying for three days or whatever, but it's works. So he must have heard of Jesus. He must have heard of the ministry. He must have heard of the miracles. He must have heard of John the Baptist. Yeah? And so he heard the message that was preached. And what is the message that they preached right at the beginning, John and Jesus? What was one of the first words they said? It begins with an R. Repent. Repent. And that's something, again, is missing in the modern church today. Mm. You came. Jesus 
therefore addresses his question with the law. That comes back with him because this was a guy that was soaked in the law. You should not murder, you should not commit adultery, you should not steal, you should not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, you should love your neighbor as yourself. That's all in the law. And the, and the rich guy says, these things I had kept, I, from my youth, what do I still lack? He had faith. Faith in works. Faith in keeping the law. Most of us can't even drive within the speed limit. Most of us don't even park where we should park. Even we can't keep in the law, can we? And the law of God's even harder than that. This is the character of a self-righteous man. It's, I do all that is required by the law. He has no admittance of sin in his life. In fact, in that short word, he says, I am Jesus now replies, doesn't he? He says, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all you have, give to the poor, You'll have treasure in heaven, come and follow me. Not when the young man heard. He went away sorrowful. That's not what he wanted to hear, was it? So he walked away, clutching everything that he had. His law, his possessions. But he walked away from Jesus. He walked away from salvation. He walked away from eternal life. The word that Jesus uses there, perfect, is probably pretty unsettling, I think, to most of us. How can we be perfect? But it reflects what Jesus has already spoken on the Sermon on the Mount. Because he says at the end, to conclude, therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. So if that gauge of righteousness is absolute perfection, what hope is there for any of us? Because we can't even keep the speed of it. We can't even park in the right parking place. Jesus doesn't create a new standard because God has got no other standard other than being perfect. God is perfect. He's never not been imperfect. He's always been perfect. So this standard is impossible to meet. And God can't lower his standards for us, can he? The judge is not going to lower his judgments because the guy is poor. He's not going to say, well, that's the cost, but because you're a use, you, you, you can pay less. So he's not going to lower his standards. But the truth of the gospel, as we know, saints, Christ crucified. Christ met this standard in our heart. God put Christ to be perfection. And we accept Christ for his God. Perfect. The word actually in Greek, teleos, means the one who has attained to the end or, or the intended final goal. If anything has fully attained that which is designed for it, then it is perfect. So when your car designed, he designs your car, and he finally wraps it up, they do the prototype, they do the this, they do everything else, the first model rolls off the production line, that first model is perfect in that designer's eyes. Everything is perfect. God designed you. And when God designed you, perfect. Because God is perfect. He can't do anything less. It's maturity. It's like watching a child grow from a child. We teach them, don't we, to grow from being a child to being an adult. But they grow into perfection. Maturity. That's natural. To be perfect, one must be willingly, and more than willingly, sacrifice everything and follow Christ. And we see this in verse nine, in the, that verse we just read in 21. To be perfect, sacrifice everything. What did he say to the young, young man? Go and say everything, and what? To follow me. Follow me. And getting back to this text, we can see the wealth had such a grip on this man that his only hope was to sell and give away his possessions. Jesus' thrust on this isn't like um, really saying, sell your possessions, give to the poor, but you know, like, come follow me. Because Jesus knew, as he knows everything, that their possessions were what was limiting that man. They were his idols. That was his thing. And Jesus indicates that he requires undivided loyalty. 
and of all Nazi opinions. This is something that obviously the young man couldn't face. He was willing to discipline himself in the works and in the keeping the laws, but the surrender of self, that was something else. And that's just clear here that he's not setting forth terms of salvation. He's not saying you've got to sell everything into the poor, okay? That's not what he's saying. But it's exposing the young man's heart, and this is where the true test comes in. Our heart. Your heart. What does it say? For where the man's heart is, therefore is his treasure. Where's your heart? So his refusal to obey, because he walked away, reveals two things. He was not blameless as far as the law was concerned because he was guilty of loving himself and of his possessions more than his neighbours. In turn, he lacks true faith, which involves the willingness to surrender all to Christ's bidding. Jesus was not teaching salvation by charity, but he's demanding that this young man gives him first place. And the young man failed the test. I think we all find that sometimes the shackles of possessions are so strong that a rich person with great difficulty can enter the kingdom of God. Because you get someone who's, who's wealthy, by any standard, that gets into a church, church is full of hurting people, and that wealthy person becomes a target for people to go and, in plain English, suck off them. Oh, you know, I can't afford this, I can't afford that, and then they put a guilt trip on them. And it's very difficult. When goods are rightly used, when finance is rightly used, it gets used for good works. Like the women who provided for Jesus, provided for his disciples, and in the case of Zacchaeus. Come for a need. This was the answer to the young man's question. It was a call to faith. It is likely that the young man never even heard or contemplated it. Because his own love of his possessions, his self-pride, remember he said, I'll keep the law. I'm great. And he saw Jesus as an equal. Not as the Lord, the Saviour, as a rabbi, but as an equal. And that was his stumbling block. He'd already rejected the Lordship of Jesus over his life. He'd already passed that away. And he walked away in unbelief. So let's get to the conclusion. This is where we see the visible morality. That man visibly approached Jesus. Yeah? Now I want you to look into yourself. You visibly approach Jesus. Jesus tells you through his word what's expected of you. Are you willing? Are you not? Are you willing to give up everything and to follow him? I don't mean a monk or nun or anything like that. It just means whether you're willing to be obedient to the word of God. The faith of works, of good deeds, of upstanding morals, of traditions and habits, that is not a saving faith. And it's that for that reason that this is before the church as a doctrine. James, actually, in his book, refers to this as a dead faith, meaning it's a mere empty profession. You can read that in James 2, 17, 20, and 26. So we go back to this key scripture that we had right at the beginning, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves. Paul wrote to the people in the church of Corinth to test and examine themselves to see if they were truly in the faith. This was important in Paul's day, but how much more important is it today? We are bombarded, bombarded with different things. So we have to put our faith to the test to make sure that we've not been deceived. And I'll put my hand up. I've been deceived. I've been deceived. I've read books by people that have sounded wonderful. I've been taught by lovely people that are good people in the faith. I would put on a pedestal. Now, see through different glasses and whether they meant it or not it's deception They're preaching something that teaching something 
that is not necessarily even in the Word of God. They will pick out scriptures, they will yeah. add commas, full stops, italics, whatever you want to emphasize something that's not there. Listen. All of us are to be theologians. All of us are to study the Bible. But when you read it and study it, read it and study it, please. Apply this one major rule. In context. In context. Who was speaking to who and when and why? Okay? You might have to go back a few verses. You might have to go back a chapter or so. Get the whole picture before you come to your conclusion. And this is what's missing today. People can be religious, they can be moral, they can be honest, they can be trustworthy in all their dealings. They may seem to be grateful, loving, kind, tender-hearted towards others, visible virtues, and external morality. Hey, the Pharisees of Jesus' day had all that, didn't they? Who was the ones that put him on the cross? Pharisees? The righteous? They put all their hope in the law. They put all their hope in the Messiah yet to come and he was standing there right in front of them. But they didn't like what he said because why? He challenged them. And this is why so many people reject the word of God today and so many people make the word of God to be out something it's not because it challenges us. And if it doesn't challenge you, then the problem is you. It should challenge you. Whatever good works they appear to have, they knew nothing really of serving the true God. And that's the same for us. Whatever good works do you really know that you are doing to serve God's glory? Are you living for his glory? Whatever the person does or leaves undone does not involve God. They're honest in all their dealings with everyone, but not with God. They won't take money or rob anyone but from God. They're thankful and loyal to everyone but God. They speak disapprovingly and reproachfully of no one but God. They have good relationships with everybody but God. They are just like the rich young ruler. All these conditions I have kept. What do I lack? focus is on visible morality, yes. But that visible morality doesn't necessarily mean salvation. Remember how Jesus told the Pharisees, you must be born again in John 3, 6. You must put on external morality. People can clean up their act, okay? It's, it's not easy, but people can clean up their act by reformation. But what's needed for salvation is regeneration. Reformation can be done. You can go through steps, you can go through phases, you can go alcoholics and, and all sorts of things. You can, you can go through certain steps. They're not Christian necessarily. They're not spiritual necessarily. Christian is through regeneration. Regeneration of your spirit. So reformation is not a mark of saving faith. Regeneration is. Regeneration. Because God is perfect. And those who are his truly his children will move in that direction. It will be natural for you to want to please God. Let's take Sunday mornings, just for an example. You've got friends over from England or from wherever. Does it please God that you're sitting in church this morning? Yeah. It's what we're called to do, isn't it? We're not forsaking the but then you get your unsaved family or friends over and they want to go to Tahiti. Mm -hmm. They'll please my friends who have come all the way from wherever they've come from or do I please my God? Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? Please my friends or please my God? Friends wait two hours. My friend Rob come over every week, totally unsafe, 
at the moment, you keep time for it, but you sat there on that chair, listen to everything. I didn't change my mind to come anyway. <laughs> but I never had that. If my friends come over, then they wait for me. I'll be out at two o'clock, one o'clock, whatever, and they'll go take you then. Still gonna be there, it's not going nowhere. Not floating off. So you move in the direction to please God. That's his perfect standard. If you're stalled, or if you're slipping in the opposite direction, then this is the time to examine yourself. This is where it comes in. Am I? Am I? And I can't answer that question. Your friend can't answer that question. Your husband, your wife, your brother, your sister can't answer that question. Only you can answer that question. And let's just get this clear as well. Pursuing this standard of perfection doesn't mean that you can't fail. Okay? doesn't mean that you, you're going to get it, actually, you're not. It means when we fail, we deal with it. We recognise it and we deal with it. And the truth is, you will fail. And in some cases, you'll fail pathetically. And you'll fail frequently. But that's the pattern of a genuine believer. Because when you fail, you know you fail, and what do you do? You try and correct it. That's because you've been convicted of the sin, or whatever it is, and you want to put it right. That's the sign of a true believer. So you may go in your prayer time every morning and be wailing for hours and hours because you're such a sinner. That's because you are moving in the right direction. Because if you didn't, it wouldn't affect you, would it? You wouldn't be worried. This is also known as uh, sanctification. Yeah, it's a process where God works in inside you. I've got a little chart here on, on that I found actually. It's in, it was in my study Bible. I've done a photo of it. I think it came out quite well. Perfection is a standard. Direction is the test. Three aspects of Christian perfection. At the risk of making Jesus' call to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, look too simplistic or too mechanical, this table will attempt to demonstrate the three aspects of Christian perfection. Positional perfection, justification, is your position in Christ. And that's by faith. And there's your scriptures that actually show you your position of perfection. Practical perfection, which obviously means the outworking, the, the mechanics, is the sanctification. That is God working through you, through your spirit, to bring it, and that is the process of sanctification. Sanctification doesn't happen when you're born again. Sanctification is the process until you get to glory. That is powered by Christ. Only He can give you that unction. But that's by faith as well. Because you've got to have faith in Christ, and He can lead you through sanctification, yeah? So we have the scriptures there at the end as well. Perspective, perfection, that's what you're perspective on. Well, that's obviously glorification. Yeah? That's to be in the presence of Christ. Hey, and I like that last one, by sight. Because you're going to see it. Face to face. That's not by faith no more. That's by sight. Amen. And those are the scriptures there. Um, if you want that, I can send it to you by um, WhatsApp or something. Um, because I have it now on my computer. So if your life's not revealing really growth in grace, in righteousness and holiness, and as I said, this is known as sanctification, then examine yourselves. Are you really in the faith? Even if you think you've done great things for God, even if you, you know what you've done, and we, again we go back to our rich young ruler, Jesus is not saying you have to become poor to gain eternal life. But he was saying it takes one thing to block the relationship with God. Just one thing will block that relationship with God. And some people like that young man may be spiritually hindered because they depend on material possessions. And uh, others, and unwillingness to give up the me time, my little sins. In other words, I have things that are more important to me than God. Got this quote, and I put that on the screen as well. It's by a guy called Paul Washer. If 
you get on YouTube much, I suggest you watch some or watch it. And he's obviously Spanish, yeah, this guy. He says, even the most mature saint, who are the saints? We are the saints, you are the saints. We struggle against worldliness and apathy towards God. There is no sincere Christian who does not lament his or her spiritual and moral failures. Yet this lamenting is one evidence of conversion. The unregenerate are unconcerned about such things. Praise God. Praise God. This is a very clever, learned man. And I recommend any of his teaching. Um, and to hear that come out of his voice, when you watch the preachings of him or you see that, it kind of encourages a little bit. Because, yeah, we're going to fail, we're going to fall over, we're going to make mistakes, we're going to sin. Yet, because we're concerned about it, that's a good sign. That's a good sign. When you kick yourself for saying something, I shouldn't have done that, I shouldn't have said that, I knew I shouldn't have done that, I shouldn't have said that, it's because the Holy Spirit in you is going, <laughs> but when you kick yourself, you know you've done wrong, you then think, don't you, I won't do that again. Like sticking your finger in a retro cross on you. I'm not going to do that again. So let's be honest with each other and honest with ourselves. Let's be honest with the Word of God. Things around us are not always good. Things around us are not always awesome. Things around us are not always great. Things around us are not always perfect. We live in a fallen world. A fallen world that's dominated by sin. Where bad is fast as good and good is fast as bad. And there is a price to pay for a sinful nature. Death. Death was the price, the first, on Adam and Eve. Yet Christ has come to redeem us from that penalty. That pain of June. He has paid it all in full. We are simply to respond to his message, which was repent, believe. Follow me. If you believe, and you really believe, then that will be visible to you and all around you. You will have a hatred for this world. You will have a hatred for the things of this world. But you'll have a desire to follow him. You'll have a desire, a burning, burning, to do what you like. And the word of God, it is a challenge. And I for one am glad. And I'm thankful for that challenge. I'm going to finish with one verse. It's in Mark. If you want to turn to Mark. Chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. And then we finish with concluding and dismiss. Then he said to them, Is it unlawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? To save the life of the children? But they kept silent. Remember, he was talking to the Pharisees. And when he had looked around them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the men, Stretch out your hands. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored as hard as the other. Verse 5 there. There's your kid. With anger. Jesus got angry. So that was a funny, happy, sticky, smiling, Norwegian looking Jesus that would be brought up with. A few times he gets angry. Casting out the money changes. God gets angry. God's angry at sin. I saw that somewhere the other day. God is angry at sin. Try putting that outside your church. Yeah. Being grieved by the hardness of their hearts. That's as simple as it is. When we harden our hearts towards God, you're grieving. Yeah. When you say, uh uh uh, that grieves you. Definitely. 
displeasure, the human sin, reveals a healthy moral nature. And Jesus' reaction here was consistent with his divine nature, and it proved that he is the righteous Son of God. That is the standard. That is the standard. Displeasure with the world. Anger. Anger. Because of the hardness of our hearts. Let's pray. Father, we just want to, I just want to thank you, Lord, for your word. I want to thank you for your, for the truth that's in the word. I want to thank you for the challenge that's in that word. Because it's a challenge every day. But I also want to thank you for the encouragement that's in that word. Because you are showing us the way ahead. You are pointing us. If we read your word, and if we stay in your word, you're pointing us in the direction we're to go in. I pray, Father, I pray, I pray, I pray that everyone here this morning will apply this word. Everyone that's listening and watching online will apply this word to their lives. To, to, to give up certain things and to follow you. He sang it in the song earlier. I will follow. I will follow. I will follow you. But then let us be doers of what we say. Let us not be pleasers of man. Not be pleasers of, of necessarily friends and family. Let us be pleasers of God. Through your words, by faith, through Christ, the glory of his wonderful name. Amen. 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 Let's stand and receive this blessing. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine down upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. You are free. Uh,